In this video, we're going to explore the actual shape molecules have once we have an idea of their, um, the way they bond and the order the atoms are combined. We're going to use Vesper theory to determine the shape around any central atom within a bonded, or within a, a, mole a covalent molecule. Um, and sometimes when we have small molecules, this will actually be the overall molecular shape. And so to determine that, we're going to um, first determine how many groups surround the atom. And by groups, I really mean things that have electrons. Because electron groups are going to have this negative charge around them. And it's repelling negative charges that create the actual structure that we see or the shape that we see. So our most stable arrangement is going to be to keep things with negative charge away from each other. And that's going to be either lone pairs or another atom. Remember, another atom is just a whole bunch of a negative charge surrounding a nucleus. So if that bumped into a lone pair that was just a big orbital filled with um, negative charge from an electron, these would actually repel one another. So we're going to try to keep them as far away from one another as possible. And that's this foundation of Vesper theory. So let's start with our, our simplest shapes and build up from there. Um, if we have an atom that is surrounded by two of these electron groups, um, it will arrange them so they're 180 degrees apart from one another. That's as far apart as you can get two things that want to be away from one another. Um, and so here, we're going to use the example of carbon dioxide. Carbon is bonded to two oxygen atoms, and we can think of these oxygen atoms as balls of negative charge that are trying really hard to stay away from one another. And by doing that, they're actually going to be 180 degrees apart. Um, and so we are going to position them 180 degrees apart, and we'll have a, a name for this geometry. It's linear. So anytime something is 180 degrees, there's a bond angle of 180 degrees from the um, atoms, we'll have a linear arrangement or a linear molecule. And it's important to note that we're really ignoring the double bonds here. It's really um, just the number of atoms or lone pairs, the things that could repel. So there being more electrons in this double bond doesn't really impact the fact that we have a localization of negative charge in this space. It's just more, there's just more electrons. All right, let's add another atom in there. Let's have a central atom that has three different atoms bonded to it. Um, now, the furthest you can get those three things from one another is 120 degrees. Um, here's an example of CH2, or sorry, H2CO. Um, and in this case, the carbon's our central atom, and it has these three atoms bonded to it that all have electron clouds that are repelling one another. And so they repel each other to the point where they can be as far apart as they can, which is 120 degrees. And so they'll arrange themselves in this um, pattern, and we call it trigonal planar, or a trigonal planar molecule, or a trigonal planar geometry. Now if we add a fourth atom, we'll have four total groups around the central atom that are repelling one another um, as balls of negative charge just from the electrons around it. And in this case, if you have four objects trying to get as far away from the, each other around a central point, the furthest they can get is 109.5 degrees um, rather than 90 degrees apart. Uh, and if you think about it, this is the shape of uh, a jack, if you're familiar with um, playing jacks. Um, or you can put your legs in front and back and then put your arms out in a Y and you've got a tetrahedral shape. And that's its name, tetrahedral, um, sorry, meaning that it has four things equally spaced around it. And kind of one of our, our easiest examples is carbon bonded to four hydrogens. And so you can see these four balls kind of repel one another. And we have a hard time representing this in two dimensions because we, if we do that, we're going to end up 
with our carbon and hydrogen bonds looking like we have 90 degree angles between our um, bonded atoms. So the way that we represent um, this in three dimensions um, consistently is with what we call wedges and dashes. So a wedge is a solid thicker line um, and it means that the atom is coming out of the plane of the paper like at you or the board and a dash line means it's going back so it's behind the plane that you're looking at um, <clears throat> and it helps to build these in three dimensions with a modeling kit to actually be able to see it and hold it and look at it um, but that's what we mean by these wedges and dashes here to try to represent this molecule in three dimensions consistently All right, now that we've gotten up to four, we're really gonna start thinking about um, what happens if one of the, the groups that's repelling is not actually a bonded atom. What if it's instead a lone pair, which takes up space around the um, central atom and will repel the bonded atoms in the same way that another bonded atom would? Let's start with this example of ammonium. So we have four groups around that central nitrogen still. We have three bonded atoms and we have this lone pair. So they still arrange themselves about 109.5 degrees apart from one another. Um, but, and this is the tricky part, we name the geometry around that nitrogen just based on the atoms that are bonded. And we do this because we can only actually see these atoms and not the lone pair with a lot of our different techniques for characterizing a compound. And so we'll name this trigonal param pyramidal uh, for the molecule or for the geometry around that nitrogen um, based on the three atoms that are bonded, although they are pushed down towards one another closer than they would if there wasn't that lone pair. And your textbook will differentiate um, and say that this is really 107 degrees, not 109.5. I'll accept 109.5, um, because it really depends on how big this central atom is and how big these um, bonded atoms are to dictate whether or not it's 109 or 107 or 106.5. But what, what they're trying to get at is that lone pairs actually take up more space than an atom that's bonded to the nitrogen in terms of its um, electron pair. And that's because a lone pair doesn't have anything that's actually tying it down on the other side. So this lobe gets very spread out. It takes up more space. If instead we had... Um, a bonded atom, we have a electron density in the um, bond that's attracted to both of these nuclei at the center of each atom. And so that kind of brings the shape um, into another point. And then the hydrogen's electron density is localized around, electron density is localized around it if it had, if that atom had more um, electrons around it. Now, if we have two lone pairs, and two bonded atoms, we still have four things that are repelling each other around this central oxygen atom right here. And so they'll still be about 109.5 degrees apart. And again, because we only can see the atoms, we're only gonna name this based on the atoms that are bonded. And so we just see these hydrogens here and this oxygen at this angle of about 105 to 109 degrees. And so we'll call this geometry bent. Here's a summary of your molecular shapes that we went over. There are more than this, but this will fit nicely for the scope of our class. Um, bent, trigonal pyramidal, tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and linear are what I'll expect you to know on quizzes and exams. And I think the easiest way to kind of track these is thinking about the actual number of groups and the, the number of atoms that are actually bonded within them. It'll also be important to know the bond angles um, for each of these, um, and that's between the bonded atoms um, to the central atom as well.
So I would recommend giving this um, a try, the practice problems here, and I'll go through the solutions um, in a separate video.